Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I hope you're enjoying this weather. I mean, it's well overdue, if you will. So, uh, so get out there. Be, 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 before you get out and start enjoying some of that weather, especially during this time frame, I'd like for you to spend the hour and uh, with us because there's an issue here on the table that we are very, very much concerned with, and that is the, our education system. It's very, very important that during those formative years, our population, especially of young folks, get the best education that they can get. It's always been an issue, and, you know, we've always talked about this on the Oregon Voters Digest. Well, of late, as you note, uh, there were some bills that were passed that sort of made it somewhat historical from the standpoint the governor now is going to be put in the governor's position would be basically the lead person, if you will, on, on education, uh, both the from, from the standpoint of the superintendent, i.e. superintendent, and are the board, kind of like a super board for that matter. I'm just trying to keep it in sort of a layman's term aspect of it, but it's a, it's a very important piece of this, it's a historical piece, and we need to spend the time to understand what that means to the bottom line, and it is the education of our young people, which is the future of this country, for the state, and whatever. So, as you know, last week um, we had Steve Buell on, who was, a, as you know, a former teacher and also a school board member of the Portland Public School, and he spent the time talking to what he felt about uh, this this change. And uh, we're fortunate today to have uh, uh, Ms. Martin, uh, Christina Martin from Cascade Institute. As you know, we've had Cascade Institute on for a number of issues here uh, in the past, but uh, they, they tackled this piece and they came up with, with their analysis of what they felt this was, will, will have the impact that it will have on our youth and education within the state of Oregon, and for that matter, around the country, for that matter. They were, people are going to be looking at, this, looking at the state of Oregon uh, as to what they, you know, basically keeping a cold, close eye, if you will, on what transpired during, the, during a certain period of time. And as you know, that uh, it doesn't start until the, the next electorate. Uh, so, so that's going to be very interesting. But we have, um, like I said, we have Christina Martin here. She, she did an op-ed piece in the Oregonian. Uh, I think it was about last Sunday or so. Yeah. Last, last Sunday. And I thought it was a very interesting one. And so I thought it would be best to have her on, to give her the opportunity to articulate. As you know, there are some things like it was an op-ed piece. That, you know, so give her an opportunity to really express herself and, and spend the time to uh, educate you about uh, what the other side, so to speak. We had a teacher on in one aspect of it, and now Christina, who's an analyst, uh, who's a policy analyst at Cascade Institute, uh, because policy, they, they took on this, this issue, and, and so we're going to spend some time with her and get some feelings about uh, the various issues. I might add that uh, there was a, in the commentary, today's commentary, and I'm talking about July 10th of the Oregonian, there was a piece that was thrown out there, a letter to the, uh, just a little caption, if you will, Schools and Civic Duty by Jim Stenson of Southeast Portland. Uh, he writes a piece in that piece, but I'm just going to take one paragraph and we're just going to kind of like start this thing up along that particular line with Christina, okay? And in this particular paragraph, and I'll, and I'll just basically quote it, it says that uh, charter schools and unlimited school choice undercut the public school mission of building communities. Home schools, online or not, cheat students of irreplaceable practice in socializing, the experience that makes civil discourse possible. You understand that? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we start off with Christina and ask her to give a sort of a definition as to <laughs> what does that mean? Christina, welcome aboard. Well, well, first of all, I think it would be useful for to people to understand what school choice is. Yes. School choice is allowing parents to pick the school where their kids go. To go. Okay. Um, it's based on the school's merits rather than just on their physical address. Okay. So there's a variety of different kind of school choice ideas. One of them is charter schools. And charter schools basically just let you um, choose a school. A, a charter school, first of all, let me explain, is okay. a public school, okay. but it is privately operated. Okay. So, so it's, it's still part it's of the still, public It's still a public school, right. and a lot okay. of people forget that. Yes. In a virtual public school is simply an online school mm -hmm. that is uh, that is a, a charter school. So it's privately operated, but it's still a public school. It's still part of the public school system. Right. Okay. And so um, this gentleman called it a, a homeschool situation. Mm -hmm. It's actually not homeschool. 
what it does is it creates, uh, it allows a family's home to become an extension of public school. Mm -hmm. So a family, maybe a child who has a hard time in a regular public school classroom, who, who would do better in going at a different pace than the other kids in his class might benefit from a virtual charter school setting. Is that a regulated situation too, though, like the public school? Um, yeah, virtual charter schools are public schools. They're public school too. Right. And so a lot of families choose this because their child is either um, very far behind in a regular, a regular public school or because they're very advanced and they get bored. And so that's, you know, I've been reading a lot of um, surveys from the kids mm -hmm. who choose uh, the state's biggest charter school, which is Oregon Connections Academy. And what they, you know, they, they mostly report one or the other, one or the other. The other thing that parents say is that they want to be more directly involved in their kids' education. Mm -hmm. And um, so we at Cascade Policy Institute believe that parents should want to be involved in their education and that, that saying, um, what was his line about, um, uh, uh, you know, Judge Susan. It, it creates community. Right, 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 right. Right. That public school's job is to create community. I actually disagree. Public school's job is to educate kids. Mm -hmm. It's to educate kids, period. And it should be about kids, not about the adults in the system, and not about choosing some culture to indoctrinate them mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. I think parents should be choosing the kind of culture that kids are exposed to. And if they're uncomfortable with their public school's education, um, they, they should be able to have them in a, an alternative, so a charter school or a, a private school if they can afford mm -hmm. it um, or get a scholarship. And homeschool is a, I, a very good option. And mm -hmm. most homeschool families actually, um, you know, homeschool students statistically do better in the long run as far as like involvement in um, attending college and performing well in college and they tend to be very involved in social clubs. Mm -hmm. So as far as, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there mm -hmm. about that, but um, maybe we want to talk a little bit more about the bills. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's 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 but before you get that, as we get, in your analysis of this whole situation, I'm sure from a historical standpoint, you went back in times of like, when did charter schools start? When did these, these so-called well, charter schools started here in Oregon in 1999, and okay. Cascade Policy Institute was actually involved in helping get the charter law passed. Okay. Uh, Cascade was actually founded to support school choice um, 20 years ago by Steve Buckstein and, um, and a few others. And uh, their goal was just simply to help educate more Oregonians about the importance of education and school choice being one of the most important issues. So they found that the education system um, could do better and that it most importantly parents um, there were a lot of parents who don't have other options and they're assigned to a school just based on where they live and if that school happens to be a school that's not doing the best job then that's you know that's, that's just wrong and so uh, Cascade was founded and started charter schools in order to give those families an option other than the school up the street and uh, I, like I said before, charter schools are public schools, mm -hmm. um, but they came out of this need for giving people an option mm -hmm. other than what's up the street. And what about the qualification between charter school and just a regular day-to-day -day school? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, are they teachers, uh, certified teachers, you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, what's, what's right. The so there are regulatory differences. Right. Um, they still have to take, for instance, state exams. Okay. Um, they, they cannot discriminate. They can't be religiously based. Charter okay. schools can't. And um, so they still do have a lot of requirements. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the great thing is, is that they have, they're much less top heavy, so they can have more control over curriculum, over style of learning. So we have, for instance, Montessori charter schools, uh, Waldorf charter schools, um, charter schools that take an approach of, um, of inquiry-based learning, that sort of thing, and just totally different approaches, very hands-on, a lot of them. And so the idea is that right now what you get in most public schools is pretty cookie-cutter. It's kind of like a factory um, factory model, and this, this really turns it around so that teachers and principals have more control over what goes on in their school, and that also, parents have more control in the sense that they get to choose whether or not to attend that school. It's not a school that you get assigned to. A regular public school, parents are just assigned to the to this school based on where they live. This is a school that parents actually have to choose. 
Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Good. That's that's a good that's a good uh, front part, if you will. Now let's get down into the legislation. They, they just recently passed these various bills and whatever. Mm -hmm. First off, let's talk about the kinds of bills that they did pass, and then let's get into quote identifying what they are. Okay. Right. So there were several bills. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the ones that have gotten the most publicity are the Oregon Investment Board, which is just a uh, oversight board that will basically oversee pre-K through college. Okay. Another is that now the superintendent is not going to be um, elected anymore, but will become essentially the governor, which means he'll just appoint somebody to that position. Um, and then there's three bills that I'm very excited okay. about, and those are three school choice bills. And this is these three bills created quite the controversy in Salem, and one allows uh, colleges to sponsor charter schools. Mm -hmm. So many states already have this. Minnesota, for instance, um, has allows their public universities to sponsor charter schools. And now, under this law, if OHSU or if Portland Community College wants to sponsor a charter school, they can. And what that means, to be a charter school sponsor right mm -hmm. now, if you want to start a charter school, you apply to the local district where you're lo located. So if someone wants to start a school in Portland, they go to the Portland Public Schools School District mm -hmm. and they send an application to the board. It's incredibly difficult to get your application approved. It takes months and months and months. It costs thousands of dollars, usually because you have to hire a consultant. You have to, um, in Portland, you have to actually do a market analysis of where students will come from. Um, one of the reasons for this is because the school board is nervous that too many kids will come from regular public schools. They the money follows the kids, right? Right. They still do. Right. A good, you know, <laughs> the money still follows the kid, and yeah. so um, there's an incentive there for them to want charter schools that actually attract kids from private school rather than from other public schools, or from homeschool rather mm -hmm. than from other public schools because, mm -hmm. well, it has to do with money. Um, so you apply to a local school board and it takes, as I said, it usually takes over a year mm -hmm. and costs thousands of dollars and it's a very politically charged process because, as you know, things with the school board tend to be pretty political, mm -hmm. their elected positions. And so what this will do is if an applicant is denied by the district, they can now go and appeal to a college, a, a public university, a public community college. And they can ask them, will you sponsor our charter school? So the college would now become the oversight over that charter school instead. And right now you can appeal to the state board, but this is another option that will, prob will most likely increase the number of charter schools in Oregon. Hmm. So they will do that. Any ideas of what areas you know that a college might be interested in, in terms of sponsoring? Well, I've heard talk of, you know, for instance, um, OH OHSU wanting would likely want to sponsor something that would help prepare kids for the medical field, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different ideas out there, mm -hmm. but it, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens there. And now this law limits the number of charter schools that um, a college can sponsor. Can, right. Right? Well, they one, can only two, sponsor one. one. Just one, okay. At right, a time. so this isn't like it's opening the floodgates, mm -hmm. it's more mm -hmm. like a foot in the door to see mm -hmm. how this works. What about community colleges? Are they part of that mix? Would they yes. Be part of that mix? Yes, so they will be allowed to sponsor one uh, each, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. Right. All right, then you, you said three, right? What was the other, we went through all three? Right, so another one of the bills is um, an, an open enrollment bill, and what that, this is probably the bill that will have the biggest impact the quickest um, starting next school year so the 2012 to 2013 school year mm -hmm. parents will be able to send their kids to other regular public schools without having to get permission from their local school statewide, statewide. Wow. so what will happen is if for instance somebody in Beaverton wanted to send their child to let's just say Portland again because mm -hmm. we're here in Portland mm -hmm. um, if they wanted to send them to a regular public school, okay, if they wanted to send them to a charter school in Portland, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be a problem. That's already an option. So what this actually does is this is going to allow them to um, regular regular public schools mm -hmm. to actually compete as far as that kind of enrollment goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what this will do is it will allow it will allow a family to ask, say, if they wanted to go to um, Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. They could go to Lincoln High School. They could say, um, 